but he's going to speak today on animal pain. And I think knowing Bernie, uh, he'll challenge us in ways that many of us have not thought about before. So Bernie, please go. <laughs> And you have a much more voice than so. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, last time I spoke at a medical school was um, Vanderbilt at the invitation of the president, who's a friend of mine, now the president of Ohio State. He asked me to meet him at his office at 3. And I was there at 3, 3.15, 3.30, 3.45, 4.00, 4.10. 4.15, a man walks out. The president was stifling a laugh. And he said, guess who I was talking to? I said, how the hell should I know? He said, uh, it was the dean of the medical school, and he was demanding extra security because of your presence. <laughs> <laughs> the schmuck had taken five minutes to Google me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, You got a light back here? No, on. On, not off. No slides for you. <laughs> when you deal with truth and beauty for a living, you don't just prostitute it out for an hour of talk. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about a lot of animal ethics is based on pain. Some of you have read Singer, Pleasure and Pain, the whole utilitarian tradition. And I want to take issue with that, largely on the basis of uh, common sense based on Aristotelianism. The basis of having a moral obligation to an entity is that what we do to it matters to it. We do not have moral obligations to rocks, wheelbarrows, tables, chairs, cars, diamonds, and other non-sentient entities. To be sure, we are morally obliged not to wreck chairs, tables, cars, but that is because what we do to them matters to a human, not to them. It is wrong to wreck a table because it belongs to someone who is negatively impacted by its destruction. If one wrecks an unowned table, one has wronged no one except perhaps potentially some person who could have used it. OK so far? If there's anything I say that, that's slippery or uh, unclear, just holler. Another way to state the same point is to affirm that only a sentient entity can have intrinsic value in a non-mystical way. I don't like that term because a lot of the environmental types uh, use it in a mystical way to talk about uh, intrinsic value of nature. Uh, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, to me, intrinsic value means, very simply, that to say an entity has intrinsic value is to say that what you do to it matters to it. It is capable, capable of, of valuing what happens to it, either in a positive neg negative way. Uh, tables and hammers and rocks may have great instrumental use, but what happens to them doesn't matter to them. Um, if you finish with your hammer and throw it away, you're not wronging the hammer. Uh, however, if you do that with the carpenter, it's, it's questionable. Um, and that's sort of what Kant had in mind when he said it's, it's wrong to use people just as a, 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 as a means, not as an end in itself. Um, any being capable of caring about what happens to it that has intrinsic value by virtue of its sentience and the fact that things matter, OK? The ability to experience pain, this is very important, is a sufficient condition, but not a necessary one for uh, being to be morally considerable. Pain is an invaluable biological tool for survival. Certainly, people who experience chronic pain or even acute pain may wish they did not feel pain when afflicted with it, but a moment's reflection reveals that lacking that capability would mean you did not lead a good life. People who lack the ability to feel pain, whether it's a result of a genetic malfunction, certain rare genetic diseases, or as a result of a nerve-destroying disease like Hansen's leprosy, um, have no alarm system warning of injury or some other harm, and eventually suffer shortened lifespans from disease or infection or injury. Okay. 
The ability to feel pain, however, is not a necessary condition for moral considerability. For example, a person or animal unable to feel pain, warning of burn or infection, resulting in loss of a limb, would still be morally considerable, and we would be blameworthy if we did not help such a person or animal preserve their limb, since being able to walk or run or grasp or have two arms does matter to that person or to that animal. Take a more interesting example. David Hume pointed out that organisms could possibly have evolved so as to be motivated to flee danger and injury or to eat and drink, not by pain, but by pangs of pleasure. Imagine that? Uh, so that if you backed into a cactus, you wouldn't feel a pain, you'd feel a little, <laughs> that feels good. But you'd know that that feeling meant that you were dealing with something injurious. Um, so the pangs of pleasure could just as well fill the relevant need uh, for alerting. In such a world, mattering would be positive, not negative, but would still, of course, be based in sentience or awareness. In our world, however, the mattering necessary to survival is negative. Injuries and unfulfilled needs, which is ramifying pain, disease. But physical pain is by no means the only relevant mattering. Fear, anxiety, loneliness, grief, uh, lack of social companionship if you're a social being, do not equate to varieties of physical pain, but are surely forms of mattering. Fair enough? Uh, this was recognized in U.S. laboratory animal legislation, uh, which I actually was a principal author of the 85 Animal Care Committee Chartering Amendment, so feel free to throw rocks at me. We did not intend it to become as bureaucratic as it did. We should have known. Um, we recognize that with the catch-all term distress, which is really meant to cover a negative mattering that wasn't a matter of physical pain. Indeed, an adequate morality towards animals would include a full range of possible matterings unique to each kind of animal. In the theoretical work I've written on animal ethics, I've argued that the basis for our obligations, at least to those animals that are under our aegis, is the animal's nature, or what Aristotle called telos. Are you guys familiar with that concept? Um, this is the unique set of powers and traits that make the animal what it is. Uh, one colleague of mine calls it the, the pigness of the pig, the dogness of the dog. It's not mystical. It's just a unique set of, of um, needs and wants and desires and activities and so forth, which make a pig a pig and a cow a cow. Um, if we raise pigs, for example, under totally natural conditions, satisfying all aspects of pig nature, from nest building to rooting, we could say we understand, I believe, happiness relative to that animal. We could <coughs> argue about that. While we do not have a word for the mattering implicit in failing to allow a pig to forage or root or build its nest, if it's a mama pig, as we keep them in modern confinement agriculture, we can plainly see that each of these <coughs> failures to meet what the animal is by nature is going to create a harm we are guilty of committing. Um, the word pain simply doesn't capture the myriad ways different treatments affect different animals. It's interesting that only at least NIH has probably 10 to 15 percent of research protocols involve physical pain. Is it any of you know that figure? Is that ballpark? Right? No? Nobody knows? Well, let's say, let's take the outside limit. Let's say it's 20 percent involved physical pain, which I seriously doubt. But 100 percent of those animals have their natures aborted and thwarted by how we keep them. That makes sense? Um, and it's interesting, you know, to think in terms of the scientific ramifications of doing that. You change the, the, the housing, the ambient environmental conditions for various animals, and you change all the baseline physiology uh, that we've, we've operated from for <coughs> years and years and years and years. That's why enrichment has become a major theoretical issue. You enrich the environment, the stress levels go down, and these parameters change. There is no simple word to express the many ways we can hurt animals besides creating